And good evening, everyone. Let me just get my screen going. Okay, does it look good? <clears throat> All right, so if you remember from last week, um, we looked at Shadagans and we looked at their development from Gutsurtk, which were the short response responsories uh, given to psalms and canticles, and how Shadagans developed as a uh, poetic uh, sacred song composition that um, was rich in reflecting on the theological meaning of the given feast or um, the, uh, the feast, the saint or the feast being celebrated on that day and meant to also give a more Christian interpretation and understanding to the Psalms. So today, we're going to look at the development of a few other genres of sacred song um, that, like the Shadagan, develop for a similar purpose in order to um, enhance the liturgical celebration of a given feast or saint. And so the ones we're going to look at tonight are called Gans or Kans, Dag, and Mevedi. And um, this is going to take us to Nadeg Monastery, and we'll focus on Nadeg's most famous monk, Grigor, who played a crucial role in the development of these genres. So as many of us know, Nadeg Monastery was founded in the 10th century. Its first abbot was Anania. It was founded uh, on the southern shore of Lake Vaughan under the sponsorship of then King Gagik Artsruni of Vaspuragan right as these, um, they're known as kind of the independent medieval Armenian kingdoms are forming, forming in the, uh, under the overarching structure of the Abbasid Caliphate. And um, what's interesting about Nadek Monastery is it was founded under the direct patronage of uh, the king of Vaswaragan and built actually very close to his twin palatial residences, his capitals essentially, at Vostan and Akhtamar. Uh, many of you know the famous church that's still at Akhtamar uh, Island. Well, he also had a big palace there that was even much bigger than the church, which is no longer there. Uh, not far away from that is Nadeg Monastery or was Nadeg Monastery. And this is also the 10th century, 10th, 11th century is a notable time for monastic history because it's right at this period when you have large cenobitic, meaning uh, monks living together, uh, monasteries being formed across the area where Armenians live. And these were uh, large permanently endowed structures that could number monks in the hundreds. And they were sponsored by the various noble uh, ruling families at the time. And they were given villages to support them to serve as sources of income and food. And um, essentially, um, because of the sponsorship of the noble lords and kings, they were able to develop into great uh, intellectual centers, of course, spiritual centers. They also sometimes served as hostels, uh, for travelers, for merchants. Um, they also um, housed relics and were sites of pilgrimage and uh, served many other functions. Of course, for our purposes, um, as we talked about in the first lecture and all throughout last year, um, it was monks and monasteries that were the great producers and transmitters of literary culture. And so it's not surprising that also in the case of uh, sacred song and verse, we get um, major developments coming uh, from the monastic realm and in specific, not a, uh, specifically Nautic Monastery. So even in its day, it was renowned as a center of vibrant liturgical worship. And so Stepanos Dadonetsi, Stepanos Asolig, uh, wrote Batmutun Diaz Eragon, Universal History, 
And in a few chapters uh, in the third book of his history, he talks about the various monastic uh, foundations and the famous monks and vartabeds of his day. And he says this about Nadeg Monastery. Also at this time, Nadeg was built in the district of Rishtunig under the same regulation, meaning following monasticism according to the, the ways associated with St. Basil of Caesarea. So founded under the same regulation with multi-talented singers who added brilliance to worship and learned scholars. <clears throat> so what does he mean by adding brilliance to worship? Well, Grigor of Nadeg is the key figure here. And he contributed in the development of several different, what later became like several different genres of sacred song, similar to a Sharagan, but a little bit different. And we'll, we'll look at that. So if you were to look for these today in books or manuscripts, what you would want to look for is a volume known as the Kansaran or Kansaran. So the 13th and, or let's see, 12th and 13th? No, 13th and 14th volumes of the Madana Kirkayots, these large, large uh, books that are published by the, um, the, uh, put out by scholars at the Madana Todan. Uh, this is a two-volume work which contains what's known as the Kansaran. Well, there's about 300 Kansaran manuscripts in existence. The earliest comes from the 13th century, and most come from about the 15th century. And it's in the 15th century or so that um, the, the collection as we know it today kind of came together. Um, if you're able to see at all <laughs> the table of contents, that tiny, tiny font, do you notice um, anything about it that might look similar to the Shadag notes or the Shadagans as we looked at last time? I, it's probably too hard to see. Well, if you look really closely, or if you have a magnifying glass, you can see that the first word of everything is Ganon. And then you get the different feast days. So Ganon Zanantian, canon for the nativity. Um, the nativity, of course, is the first feast in the liturgical year. And then you kind of go down from there. And so this like the Shadag notes, is essentially organized according to the liturgical calendar of the Armenian church. Um, let's, let's look at an example of one of these, what, what you would find if you went to one of these Ganons. So I picked Ganon Choror Tavur Zanantian Christos Yastudzo. So this is canon for the fourth day of the nativity of Christ God. So as you know, the major feasts of the liturgical year, such as nativity, Easter, etc., have eight days of celebration following them. And each has their own uh, special hymns and uh, things like that. And so here's the canon of the Gaunts for the fourth day after um, nativity. And um, it's it's a fairly long text, the Gans, and we'll talk about uh, about it a little bit. Um, do you notice, first of all, what's what's the first word of it? Cons. Exactly. Cons. Exactly. So what is cons? I assume you're going to tell us. Yes. Treasure. 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 Oh. Exactly. Exactly. It also has a secondary meaning in, in Middle Persian, which it's the borrowing from, which is song, actually. 
and kind of both those meanings are relevant uh, here. Um, do you notice how it's very hard to tell, I think, again, but some of the letters are bolded that start out the stanzas? Yes. You see that on the side? If you pick out the bolded letters, does it spell anything? I can't see them. It's tough to say what's bold or not bold. It is. So yeah. here's the first one. Mm -hmm. And here's the second. And then you jump down to here. And then here's the next bolded one. Krikor. Krikor. Exactly. Krikori. And then we need to go to the rest of it. Here's the next. Next. Yerk. And the last, Yerk, exactly. So what is Krikori Yerk? Song of Gregory. Exactly. And this is actually Gregory of Nadeg. So he wrote this one. And um, he kind of inscribed his name as author on by doing this, what's called an acrostic. So remember, last time we saw one example of an alphabetic acrostic, which was the Sharagan for the Hreb Simeons uh, by Catholicos Gomidos, where you had each stanza start with a letter of the alphabet. Here's yes. another type of acrostic where the usually two to three words where the author either puts something about his name or the name of the feast or saint that it's associated with. Um, so Gregory of Nodok actually invented this genre. He was the first to write these gonsk. And we'll look at a little more detail about um, what's distinctive about them. Um, so the first word is Gans. We see his name uh, starting each stanza. Here it is in uh, Abraham Tyrion's uh, book, The Festal Works of St. Gregory of Nodak, which translates all the Gansk and the odes and, and things. And so you can see how he also put in the margins for each of them, what the acrostic uh, was, so that you can see that um, the Armenian letters. Okay, so remember how the Shadagan canon had like eight different parts. And so for each feast day, there were eight different Shadagans that you would do in response to a different psalm or canticle in the different hours of the liturgical, the liturgy of the hours. So the Gans Ganon is a little bit similar to that. So it starts with the Gans. And then after that, you find things that look like this. So what do you see in the title? Um, what's the title of this one? Poch. Yeah, this one is poch, and this one over here is dach. Dach churot avurah. Exactly, dach churot avun aravodin. So this one associated with the morning, probably for morning prayer, um, and a dach this time, and we'll talk about what that is. And then you get another dach. The same day, but for evening hour. So during evening prayer, and then poch. Poch, we'll talk a little bit about the end, but it essentially means either some kind of variable or variation or like alternate form that you could do. Um, most of the, uh, essentially all of the Gans Ganons for each different day of the year in this book follow the same structure. You get the main Gans to start out with, and then you get one or more Dogs, and then Pochs, and sometimes also Meredi, which is essentially um, 
a shorter kind of doll. Um, so how about this word? Um, let me see here. What, what, what is, what, what are these uh, forms or genres? What makes them distinctive? So first of all, the gans, um, it's usually defined as a poetic litany um, in free verse, meaning not fixed meter or syllables per line. Um, and it's the main part of the ganam. Um, the dar is in verse, and you can even see that here, how uh, it's usually the same number of syllables, a more strict metrical pattern, same with the poch. And um, whereas the litanies, the gants, are requesting something of God, they're usually um, addressed to God and beseeching for something. You can see in the English here, so it um, kind of reflects on the feast, and then it has a refrain, please intercede Christ the King to come to our help, we plead. Um, the Dal and Meredi are, are, are not intercessions, they're just like theological reflections on the meaning of the feast. And um, they're usually, they probably would have been sung in a much slower and melismatic form. Melismatic means uh, multiple notes per syllable, kind of that like long, elaborate, slow way of singing, but we don't really know in most cases how, how they were performed. Um, but we know that they would have been performed uh, communally. And so um, here you can see uh, an example from one of the gansas that St. Gregory wrote, which even refers to the context in which they would perform these. So he says, gathered we all in the holy universal apostolic church, we earthlings in circles sing there in many groups, praising with the myriads of spiritual beings angelic, we join the circles of the luminous kind. And then there's a refrain. We bless the one coming to you, the most holy trinity with whom we plead. Okay, so um, let's kind of circle back now and go into a little bit more detail and see some examples of each type of these, Gan, Stag, um, Mehadi, and Po. So first of all, Gans, what does the word mean? Where is it from? And what can that sort of tell us about the genre? So um, as Mary mentioned, the word means treasure. And it also had another meaning in, in Middle Persian, which was song. And these types of compositions um, didn't come to strictly be known as gans until a little bit later. The authors of their texts called them by many different names, and you can see all those names here. Gans, Karos, Pan, Yerk, Kovas, Ganon, Gark. Remember in the acrostic, it was Krikori Yerk. So he's using the word Yerk to refer to it, something you sing, a song. Um, almost all of uh, Gregory's, be and he wrote 10, uh, begin with the word Kants. And probably that's why they came to be called that, like as a genre. And then you get the Kansaran, so the place where all the Kanses are found, the book where they're all found. And interestingly, in Syriac, you have almost the exact same thing. So there's, there's a book, a liturgical music book called the Beith Gazo, meaning like the treasure house, kind of like Kansaran. And so it also um, has this kind of cluster of meanings of treasure, spiritual treasure, spiritual song. And I think it's um, especially appropriate to refer to these pieces as Gansk. If you think about the whole meaning and purpose behind their composition, 
So what, what is the reason why anyone wrote these to begin with? It's to add poetic and theological reflection on the meaning of the feast. So really to, to open up the treasury of meaning and, and pull out the various treasures within. And so, and it's something that you, you sing. And when you sing something, you give it more gravity, right? So even in Badadak today, you go and, you know, you read the epistle or something like that, but you always sing or chant the gospel and you do it slowly and clearly because it gives it more gravity and weight. Uh, same with these. And with the dogs and the uh, pochs, melodies, they would be sung even slower so that um, this deep theological meaning would be given time and space to kind of reflect and go deeply into your mind and your heart as you're listening. Um, we don't have very good uh, ideas of exactly how all of them would have sounded, but um, it, it must have been a great experience to hear them rather than just uh, read them on the page like, you know, most, most people would do today looking at them. Um, <clears throat> so how about, um, so this, this is the word comps. How about the origin of the genre? Like, what was it based on? Where did it come from? So it developed from the kados. Is anyone familiar with this term, kados? So the kados is a very important part of the Jamakirk, the Liturgy of the Hours, the Jamakutyun, and it's a part that the deacon always chants out loud, proclaims out loud. Um, it's a borrowing from Syriac, kados otho, which means proclamation or litany. Um, we have this nice uh, definition from Bishop Daniel, who says that in the Armenian church, a kados is chanted by the deacon and addressed to the people. It always precedes a prayer offered on behalf of the people by the priest and serves to invite the assembly to pray together for particular intentions. It's sometimes translated as litany, petition, or proclamation. Um, and it's, it's um, a part of every single one of the different hours of prayer in the liturgy. The hours often multiple. And so we can look at one that maybe you're familiar with because the Aravakal sunrise service is done during Lent. And so a lot of us hear this um, uh, every year. So, um, etc. So then after these petitions are made, there's a response now said by the priest, but um, maybe back Back at the beginning, it would have been said by all the people present, get so dear, save us. And the deacon says, Zara vodas luso, yev zara chiga ores ha u tiampan sitza no hava dov, idiarne hantres tsuk, shnori a dear. It's a response. Here's the English translation. From sunrise in the east to sunset in the west, and throughout the entire Christian world, wherever people call on the name of the Lord and holiness by their prayers and intercession. May the Lord have mercy on us. By our vows of faithfulness, let us ask God to save us from sin and from the desire of the world. May the Lord accept the vows and requests of our hearts and count us worthy of his faith and his commandments together with all his saints. Almighty Lord, our God, save, uh, raise us to life and have mercy on us. Response, raise us to life, Lord and then back to the deacon, that he may lead us through this morning of light and the day ahead in peace and in faith. Let us ask the Lord, grant it, Lord. And then there's uh, many other petitions here that are said, but I'm not including all of those. So the Gans took this as its model and then also added elements from sacred song, uh, poetic song of other traditions. And um, we can look at those. So 
unlike the kados, um, there aren't, there isn't this communal response. Instead, there's a refrain, uh, which is like the chorus almost. So when everyone comes in together and repeats the same uh, line over and over. So in the first one, or in our example one, it was that, please intercede Christ the King to come to our help, we plead in italics after each stanza. That would have been done by all the people together. And then, um, so there's these uh, two important kind of poetic uh, genres from Syriac called the Mimro and the Madrosho. Mimro is a verse homily. So, um, consisting of isosyllabic couplets. So <clears throat> it essentially reflects uh, on a feast or on a specific saint and usually involves praise of that uh, saint and exhortation to the people and it's in verse. Um, a madrosho, which is more important for us here, is a stanzaic hymn, so multiple stanzas, with a congregational refrain after each stanza. Um, and both of these often used acrostics to kind of uh, cement their structure, uh, either alphabetic or uh, the person's name or the name of the saint it was devoted to. And so um, the Gonsk borrowed uh, these elements the communal refrains and the acrostics, either alphabetic or of another kind, and um, kind of took the kodos and transformed it in that way. And that's essentially what the gons uh, is. And um, <clears throat> it's interesting and not too surprising that at this time um, that would have happened, as, as we all know, Armenians and Syriacs uh, have kind of always lived together and uh, exchanged uh, texts and traditions and things. And also in the ninth and 10th century was, was a major period uh, again of living together and sharing uh, of texts. So um, how about now we look at a doll. So, um, whereas the Kants would introduce the feast and um, uh, then have these kind of refrains that are like petitions addressed to the Lord, the Dal sort of returns uh, to the same feast or theme, but in a more uh, poetic way that's meant just to kind of revel in the, the mystery and meaning. And you get very elaborate and, and just beautiful, powerful language uh, in these pieces. So let's read this in Armenian first and try to listen and observe what kind of poetic devices do you see or hear in the text. This is just the beginning. This is the ode um, for... Oh, I didn't even write it down. This is also written by Gregory. This is for the raising of Lazarus, I think. This is also one of Gregory of Nodex. En noro norin nuin newt, newt eaganin enen haneits ko, koln hocheits yaravorial deep, deep yeranutian nerantunag ner. Ner ner pohagan nevasta dit gerb, gerb yera marin yertsutsani shuk, shuk dara shesho, zer mech aso is ged, ged gadara lutz gutsortak tsial yev eak tsial med, med dareramin tsainas der tsial ye prayagan derayk, derayk kovasanagan haman kamein tsitas danyan, Posta Zavarj Yerk. Yevalen, Yevalen. So what what kind of poetic devices do you see? 
the last word in each line is the first word of the next line. Excellent. That's the obvious one. Did everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. So newt, newt, co, col, deep, deep, near, near. This is called chain verse, chain verse composition, where the last word of the line starts the next word of of the first. Um, what might what purpose might this have uh, besides being a nice you know poetic device? Just continuity of the of the theme from line to line. Yes. Also, th- think in terms of like very practical, functional terms for remembering it. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, most poetic devices have a very practical, functional uh, purpose of being uh, to aid in memory uh, because you're going to be chanting or singing these and you need to be able to remember it. So these kind of lock in, in the performer's minds, you know, you get to the end and that's, that's your, your lock to start the next one and then you can keep going. Yeah. Um, what else? Other other poetic devices. Remember, there was the one I said that was the most important for Armenian poetry, or the most fundamental. Alliteration. Alliteration. Yeah, all all throughout this one. Listen. So, what is the alliteration in the first line? And noro nori nui nut. All ends. No, 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 exactly. Newt e aganin enen haneitko. Maybe e. E is the verb of existence, and this is all reflecting on existence, essence, being, etc. In the beginning. Uh, more, more new. Ner ne po agan nevasta deep gerb. This this line is sh. Shuk dara shusho, zer mech also is good, and here ge, ge gadara lutz gatsor taktsial yev eaktsial med. Let's look at the translation of this. So this is Abraham Terion's translation from the Festal Works book. So the existent, ever of his own essence the essence of the one who is, the existent, the one distinct from all that is, the first cause of things that came to be out of nothing, the first cause of blessedness on whom everything depends, archetypal image of the praiseworthy lesser ones, archetypal image of the youthful hosts of heaven who appeared as his shadow, overshadowing the elements that were formed at the end, the end of perfection toward which created beings strive. So with their laudations did the youthful choirs of the Hebrews strive. Youthful choirs, praising with songs, olive branches being waved, with songs of glad hosannas along the royal highway. The royal highway, the path covered with rags and rainbow colors, the luminous path he took on a donkey as crowds of Jewish elders gathered, took palm branches to give glory with palm branches to the giver of gifts from above. Glory to the one riding the admirable donkey, the praiseworthy colt. The colt and the donkey at the command of the Lord of hosts, the word. The word was coming to Jerusalem, descending like a charioteer from the mountainside coming to one who was a forerunner, a host in Bethany. There was tender, sibling compassion in the broken hearts of the Marian sisters. Such compassion for the dead, expressed with tears as the sisters met the Messiah with their plea. The sisters implored again the all-embracing gift who breathed the breath of life. The gift, able to transform the speechless dead body. The dead body, wrapped in burial clothes, to be clothed and sealed with breath again by the caller to life. 
the seal of death was broken, as were the torments of hell, the torments by the evil one, who cannot harm the blessed assembly, the great Hebrew assembly, a galaxy of thousands, praises in song the glory, the glory of the one who bestows light, now and eternally. Amen. So as you can see, they're, they're very dense and very rich, uh, beautiful reflections. There's, there's no petition in this, right? There's nothing being asked for, nothing being urged upon either the people to do or God to do. It's really just meant to be a deep poetic uh, reflection on the mystery and meaning of what's going on in whatever uh, biblical story uh, is being celebrated that day. And uh, Gregory was really a master of composing these. He has 21 or so of these odes, and each of them is is characterized by that just very rich and dense, dense uh, language uh, mm -hmm. with, with very uh, uh, elaborate poetic devices like this. Um, of course, we know Gregory most for his prayer book, the Madian Voch Berkutian, but in terms of uh, poetry um, and like literary creation, um, these pieces really, really stand out. And um, these, this book by Abraham Terion is excellent because not only can you read it in English, but there's really dense uh, footnotes accompanying each of these pieces. And um, without them, it would be hard to follow sometimes what St. Gregory is talking about because he's drawing so much on Almost every line has an allusion to some piece of scripture. And so if you don't have scripture, uh, you know, as internally uh, part of you as a medieval monk like Gregory did, it's, it's hard to get all the meaning. But Abraham Terion does a great job of bringing that out uh, in the notes. Um, <clears throat> so... Let's see. Yeah, so in the Gansaran then is, is where you go to find all these pieces. So by the 13th or 14th century, um, they, they came together to put together all the Gansk and the Dach and Melody and Poch all together. So that just like for the Shorog notes, when you would come to a specific feast day, when you would want to use one of these at the celebration of a specific feast, you would be able to go to the book and find it and then use it. Um, Gregory lived in the late 10th, early 11th century, and he wrote just 21 of these odes and 10 of the Gonsk. So over the years, over the centuries, uh, up until the 15th, you had many other authors writing in these genres for all the other feast days uh, of the liturgical year. And then eventually you get the whole thing filled out. So someone who wrote a lot of these, for example, is Nersa Shnorhali. Uh, while Gregory wrote 21 dal, uh, Nersas wrote over a hundred. And they're also uh, very rich and beautiful. And actually uh, I wanted to show one here that our own Matt Sarkisian uh, translated. So this is an ode that um, Nersa Shnorhali wrote for the feast of the Hripsimians. So here's Ode to the Holy Virgin Hripsime. And um, what do you notice about the bolded words to start the stanzas? There's eight, eight stanzas. What does it spell? Kripsime. Kripsime, exactly. So instead of the author's name, in this case, you get the saint that it's devoted to. And let's just read a couple stanzas as examples. Hanjarer shnorhalit andriale, harkait zarmee, 
Mez Barkev Idanen Ladine, Hereshtag, Hereshaker, Hripsime. Raha Hort Uevor Yergnen Tats, Orinats Yergnainuin, Horas Katz, Uratial Zansen Yevis Pares Hedem Yats, Hereshtag, Hreshaker, Hripsime. Imastun Surp Gusan Kerharko, Hurov Panin Ihergir Argelo, Varetzer is Labder Havado, Hreshta Krasha Ker Hripsime. So, in terms of poetic devices, what do you, what stands out here? The last sentence is repeated in every stanza. Exactly. So, here's, it's almost like a refrain, Hreshta Krasha Ker Hripsime. It's the same line in every single one. Exactly. What else? We could also say alliteration again, um, especially in that line that's repeated. Mm -hmm. So hrypsime. So he uses that letter ho um, in honor of her. You could say in honor of her name. Hreshtag hrasha ke hrypsime. You're sort of uh, rhyming at the end of each line. Exactly. Within each, uh, yeah. Yep, exactly. So, um, uh, Nersus uses rhyme a lot. And um, his uh, relative, Greek or Magistros, who lived a century before him, was the first to really introduce rhyme into Armenian poetry, uh, borrowed from the Arabs. Uh, as I mentioned in the first lecture. And so uh, Gregory of Nadek uses rhyme extremely sparsely um, and not in his odes, really. But here, Nersesh Norali uses it in his ode, and a lot of the later writers of odes will use rhyme. And you can see he picks a different rhyme for each stanza. So here it's A, here it's Ats, here O, here Yal, uh, etc. And we can read a few of Matt's um, uh, lines from Matt's translation. So, sagacious, graceful, chosen she is. From a line of mighty king she is. To us a gift from the Latin house. Wondrously beautiful angel, Hedipsime. Wayfarer, wanderer, traveler of heaven, profoundly perceptive of the heavenly law, having renounced self and glory of patrimony, Wondrously beautiful angel, Hrypsime. Wise, holy virgin, most revered, with fire of the word cast upon earth. So, yeah, wise, holy virgin, most revered, with fire of the word cast upon earth. You ignited the lantern of faith. Wondrously beautiful angel, Hrypsime. So, um, it, it, it's a really good translation uh, because you really hear the, the, the poetry coming through uh, in English. There, there's very good balance to the lines and even some alliteration, wayfarer, wanderer, profoundly perceptive uh, that comes out in the English too. Um, Jesse, can I ask a qu quick question there? Yeah. This just this line, to us a gift from the Latin house is us here um, Armenians or just yeah. people? Armenians, exactly. Because Hedipsime so, is there politics in this? Could be a, Latin, a lot of Latins running around around this time. Around that time, exactly. Yeah, so could be, um, and especially because Nersus and some of the uh, Cilician uh, writers, um, you know. Uh, were related to the people who had made an alliance with with the Latins to form the Armenian Kingdom of uh, Cilicia, and so yeah, very good historical observation about celebrating Hrypsime. She's a figure that is a unifying figure between Latins, Romans, and Armenians, and so yeah, very very nice observation could work. Um, so. There's the dog became an extremely um, um, wrote like popular genre after this, and throughout throughout the course, we'll come back to different kinds of dolls that were written. 
um, <clears throat> this poch that we see uh, com coming near the end of the lecture. So the poch that we see is really a rubric. This, this means it's a kind of direction uh, given to those performing a service. And it means one of four different things. So first, it could be an antiphone, meaning it's something to be chanted or sung in response to the main um, or, or, or sung in alternation by two different choirs. It also sometimes indicates a change in melody. So you were going along with uh, one sort of way of singing, and then you have poch to indicate, okay, remember, now sing it in a different way. Um, or it it's a different kind of transition, meaning like now a priest should sing this part instead of deacons, or uh, maybe a group of deacons rather than an individual deacon. And then also sometimes, as we saw before, it could be used as in title for an otherwise untitled partial or modified ode. So sometimes you would take one, say you would take a, a, a doll written for Mary, the Blessed Virgin, and then you could just take it and use it for a feast of the church. Because so many of the images and metaphors and language about Mary is also used for the church. And so this also sometimes happens. So this is just to clarify, if you see poch, um, that it could mean <laughs> kind of any of these things, but it's not really like a genre like Kant's or Dahl is. Okay, so um, from the time of Gregory until the 15th or 16th century is when you have all these Gonsk and Dahl that are written. And um, the last sort of major phase of development in the Kansadon and then putting it into its form was by a 14th, 15th century figure, Grigot of Chalat, um, who added, who's associated with adding certain feasts to the liturgical year and then composing Gonsk for them. So um, stepping back now, just to say something about what are, what are kind of the significance of these? Well, like the Shadag, the Shadag notes and all the Shadagans, it's really, um, in the Sharagans and the Gansk and the Dach, where you really find the most theologically dense and rich reflections on the meaning and symbolism of the various feast days and mysteries of the Armenian church. And even to this day, they're a very underexplored and underexploited uh, resource uh, for us. So, um, Thankfully, now we have Abraham Tyrion's translation of Gregory's uh, odes and uh, Gonsa's, but there's a rich, rich library of texts like this waiting to be explored, waiting to be translated, waiting to be discovered. Um, and we can all hope that uh, Matt will continue his translations of dolls and others maybe will be inspired to do so. And that could be a great future uh, volume in the sources from the Armenian Christian tradition, which we just started. So thank you everyone uh, for your attention again tonight. And uh, we can turn to the questions now.